Bueno, uh, voy a hablar en español porque nuestro amigo Romeo sé que entiende español. Uh, puedo hablar en inglés, pero creo que no hay problema, ¿verdad? Bueno, es un motivo de alegría, honor, orgullo tener al doctor Romeo Cardoso aquí en Biomédicas. Eh, él es un brillante científico y viene de la Universidad Federal de Minas de Gerais, en Belo Horizonte, en Brasil. Y aunque no lo crean, tiene un Medical Doctor Degree en 1965. Y tiene un PhD en Pathology. Pero él se, se convirtió poco a poco en biólogo. Y lo dice con orgullo, cosa que a mí me da mucho gusto. Y Romeo ha hecho varias contribuciones importantes en biología y una de ellas que tiene varios años desde 1992 es el concepto sistémico de lo que es un gene uh, recientemente un hermano mío físico me preguntó que qué era un gene y no supe contestar muy complicado pero recurrí al artículo de Romeo y decidí leer ese pedazo. En 2008, él tiene una contribución importante de un enfoque reduccionista de los polimorfismos de proteína junto con la evolución de la complejidad en los animales. Y... En, desde 1995, él elaboró un modelo biológico del origen y evolución del código genético. Su modelo, del cual él tiene varias publicaciones, se llama Cell Referential Model. Tuve el gusto de conocerlo en Montpellier, en Francia, en 2011, eh, y ahí tuvimos agradables intercambios. Tiempo después conocí a su esposa Nina, Nina me contó que cuando él había regresado a casa, había dicho que había conocido a un mexicano genio, pero cinco días después, digo, no, está loco. <risa> Lo agradable es que estuvo en Cuernavaca, en el Centro Internacional de Ciencias, Romeo Nina, sabio, también su alumno, estuvimos como un mes trabajando juntos. De ahí salió un artículo eh, sobre el digamos, un modelo del código de anticorones, que es el que yo sepa el único que hay. Eh, yo, por mi cuenta, eh, hemos contribuido a un modelo matemático del origen, más bien, de la evolución del código genético, pero que ha hecho colapso o crash con su modelo entonces eh, pudimos demostrar que el modelo otros modelos como el de Rodan Ono y el nuestro eran iguales entonces hay una manera de demostrar que el modelo de Rodan Ono es equivalente al nuestro y el nuestro equivalente al de Rodan Ono y bueno, esto lo publicamos, pero Romeo fue uno 
de los revisores. Y él, pues, rechazó el artículo, nos defendimos, y ahí nos hemos vivido, eh, donde yo soy el referee de muchos de sus papers, eh, tengo que sacar, comprar cartulinas para volver a hacer sus cuadros, sus tablas, para entenderlo. Y debo decir al final, para no alargarlo, que es un honor para mí tenerlo como amigo, pero es que siempre estoy aprendiendo de él. Es un maestro. Para mí sigue siendo un maestro. Y cada vez que hablo con él o discutimos, aprendo cosas nuevas. Entonces está aquí ahora porque vamos a hacer un modelo matemático de su modelo que resulta que sí va a haber convergencias con nuestro modelo. Nada, estamos hablando de tiempos distintos. Lo interesante de su modelo, bueno, tiene muchas cosas interesantes, pero una de ellas es que él empieza donde debe de empezar, de lo más sencillo, del principio. Entonces, su contribución sí está pegado al origen de la vida, a la parte de la piedra, de la geoquímica, donde se ven arcillas, se ven eh, superficies que actuaron como catálisis para obtener polímeros. Y bueno, pues aquí los dejo con el maestro amigo Romeo. Yo siendo de Brasil, el presidente tiene la manía de hablar con, los, es, con la planta de español en, en una mezcla que se llama portuñol, pero no me atrevo a, a mantener esto, que será una, una confusión enorme. Hay tantas palabras que tienen duplo sentido, que, que es siempre una, una confusión. Entonces... I ask your excuses for speaking in English. I think it will be less complicated for me. Uh, whenever a word in Spanish has another sense than Portuguese, then I try to mix them. Everybody will laugh at me, and then it's better to avoid it. Uh, I thank Marco for inviting me to get in here. Uh, I don't know if you all have the news from Brazil that we are having a, a very crazy uh, president now. But I heard from some of you that yours is also the same. <laughs> And then we are all, all together. Uh, the point is that I looked for people in Brazil that could help me with the developments in, in my projects there with the code. And I couldn't find things couldn't find people, everybody's busy, everybody's rushy, and, uh, but Marco, I know from very long, he's interested in the subject, and then we are going together with this. Uh, this first, I'll have only 12 slides. Uh, we'll spend uh, some time in each one of them. Five times, five minutes, each slide is an hour. I hope it's, a, it's all right. We don't get lost inside all those slides. Uh, the talk, I heard that uh, Lascano made a talk on this same subject here about two months ago, was it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Then we'll have the opportunity of comparing those ideas. Uh, 
I know he belongs to the, a school that works a lot on the RNA world thing, and I don't. And then it will be good to have the two sides of the, of the ideas. Uh, to start with, uh, what pushed me into this, finding a definition or concept of life and of living beings, is something that is kind of disconcerting for biologists, that uh, we are working in biology and it's difficult to have a consensus or an agreement on what life is. And uh, this is bothering, yeah? We should be the experts on this and we don't know what we are studying. It's kind of complicated. Then it's a challenge. And uh, I hope I can have some clarification on, on it for us. I, I forgot to, to be here, on the, but it's all right. Yeah? Uh, then I have this clarification. Um, this is always a work in progress. There's no final decision. The subject is very complicated. It's called the, the paradigm of complex systems. And uh, we don't have the expectancy of solving all of it at once. But one way I decided to approach the problem is to giving attention first to a question of what are living beings. And I think that having this well described, uh, and these are easier to describe because they are concrete objects. Yeah? Us, we are living beings. A bacteria is a living being. And then we, we can have uh, more uh, ways of approaching with more clarity uh, on the definition of this. And I hope that having this defined, we get life as a consequence, and that's easy. Yeah. The problem from, that arises from the attempts of defining life from the beginning. Everybody has its own definition of life. Physicists have a definition of life. Mathematicians go, everybody feels free to, to have a definition of it. And that means that life ha can be approached to very different things. But biologists have one way of approaching, which is studying living beings. Uh, the problem also reaches uh, some kind of a, a clash or a conflict with religious uh, approaches that used to say that life is something that was, uh, in, was put inside something that was not alive to make it living. And this kind of thing uh, would say that life is an entity. And this may be one of the problems of making it difficult to approach. Uh, with this approach, it started from living beings. Uh, we are not saying that, we are saying that life is not an entity. It's something that grew from the inside of living beings. Then this is the, the nice of the approach of starting with living beings. We know what organisms are, we define them, and then we say that life is the whole set of properties of living beings and some specific set of these uh, activities of living beings. That's one approach. Uh, the other is this picture here. I like this picture. That's the, the Le Penseur from Gustave Rodin, Auguste Rodin, and the Quixote. Uh, I think it's a good description of us. Uh, we are lunatics thinking that we are doing something good or we try to think of everything and at the same time uh, making fantasies and uh, it, it, I think it's a good de description, description of humankind. Yeah? You're not only, we are not only lunatics and not only uh, thinkers, rationals and things. We mix these things together then the, the approaches to studies that we use 
I, I think I can put this in, in these three categories. We use our emotions, aesthetics is one of them, uh, in everything we do. And science also has lots of emotions involved in it. And there are two sides of the things we work. From direct observation of nature, which is the empirical way of approaching things, and the formalisms that our mind puts in everything it works on. We try to put formalisms into emotions, into nature. One of the uh, developments of this putting together formal in, formalisms and empiricism is the main method of uh, science, experimentation. We tend to try to describe nature with procedures that involve formalities, like uh, uh, isolating conditions, isolating contexts and things, and so that we can take uh, descriptions of nature with a good sense. And when we get those descriptions and they satisfy our aesthetics and emotional approaches, we are pleased with it and say, oh, that's a good model. <laughs> and then I think I made a list of things that we have to learn from this first slide. This is going from the concrete to the abstract. This is the, the icons of the human activities the three roots of our quest for knowledge. And the uh, one thing that we might aim at is to have a simple description of things. And that's what I'm trying to do, in spite of the object being very complex. Uh, I like to, this, this is a, a summary of what we are going to do. We are going to describe uh, first individuals, I have here five slides there, uh, then we go to the populations of living beings which are made through interactions between individuals, and then we get some things of the uh, human uh, activities that are, are affecting the whole of the evolution of life. I have only two technical uh, slides that will be the first ones after this, uh, so that uh, I will excuse myself for tra bringing these two technical things that may be not easy for m some people to understand, but it will help for those people who do understand chemistry to uh, know that the ideas I'm bringing are based on some empirical stuff and not re just ideas coming from, from the mind. And this is the picture, uh, a summary picture of, a, of what a living being is and of how it was made. Uh, we have here a, a halter with the two sides. One is nucleic acids and one is proteins. And the idea for the origin of life, for me, it, it's right in the beginning. It's in the, the waist between these two sides of the halter. The weight. The waste here would be uh, the uh, system of protein, sy protein synthesis. That's the greatest simplification possible to say that a living system is a system that makes proteins. We have here nucleic acids, which are the memories and the uh, and the producers of proteins. These include genes and ribosomes and RNA all in between. And this makes the system that makes proteins, and proteins are the workers and the products of the memories. Then I have memories, uh, the products, and this system developed a way of getting sustainability which comes from metabolism, which is made from proteins. You see the arrows here are bidirectional. Proteins makes nucleic acids the same way as nucleic acid makes proteins. This makes a circle. The circular things are very difficult for us to, to manage, to, to try to know where it started from. One idea that we have is that living beings arose 
on the Earth. We, there are many hypotheses of it coming from the outside, but none of them is still strong enough. Then it comes from the Earth. Uh, for sure it comes from geochemistry. And then we have to learn something from geochemistry that could make proteins first, and then having proteins, and this geochemical start gave origin to a system which is RNA and protein. That's the simplified view of how this protein synthesis system started. From something that is unknown from geochemistry to make protein, and then these two together gave origin to the protein plus RNA thing. And this is the, the, the reason. There's a star here which is the, the start of things. We will have some concepts on the living beings first and then life later. We give some, some part, the, the, there are the two partitions of the living being. One partition is the metabolism which interacts with the environment. The other partition is internal, RNA and protein. DNA is not much uh, involved with this because everybody agrees that it's a late introduction after RNA was already there. Then we get to populations and how the interactions are done, and then the, the description of uh, what humans, some of the aspects of, human, uh, of the human activities nowadays. Uh, one first uh, <clears throat> teaching that we need to know of is how to get uh, systems of protein synthesis at the beginning of life and as it is today. As it is today, that's the, the big picture here of a ribosome. This is the present day machine that makes proteins. It's called the ribosome. Uh, I have a, a simplified description of what a ribosome is. Uh, it is a structure that holds two tRNAs together and facilitates protein synthesis at, those, at their tails, the tails of the tRNAs that carry amino acids. Then the, this same description of a structure that holds two tRNAs together and facilitates the synthesis of uh, the fusion of two amino acids together. And I was brought, I will not give you the details of what the genetic code is or what, but I took this idea here to generate a proto-ribosome which is possible and plausible in accordance with uh, prebiotic origins. And that is a simile or a mimic of the ribosome. Uh, this structure here has two oligomers, which are chains of something that we don't know what they were. They may have been peptides, may have been RNA, may have been something else. Uh, it was made from geochemistry, uh, oligomerized on top of crystals, and they, they are oligomers. The only thing that are, is necessary from them is that they can pair one with the other and they can carry amino acids at their tails. Then I call them proto-tRNAs, but they may not be RNA, may be RNA, or may be proteins, something else that was there at that time where a system of protein synthesis was starting. Uh, you see here that the two tRNAs are paired laterally one to the other following a sequence of messenger RNA. The messenger RNA has a sequence of uh, codes with, which are complements to the codes in tRNAs and these are joined laterally guided by the messenger. He, in this structure here, uh, the physics, especially the quantum physics people, call these things singularities. That's a singularity. We have two proto-tRNAs that substitute these two here, and they bind one to the other 
the, there, there was no messenger RNA at that time. There were only codes in the proto-tRNAs themselves. Then there is a, they pair with each other. When they pair with each other, we have a proto-ribosome, a structure that holds two tRNAs together and that facilitates the transferase reaction there. Only that the structure is the two tRNAs only. That's something that I had to develop depending on the, the empirical stuff I had. And from this, then the model for the genetic code comes from this. The codes are here, the codes are in those oligomers, and they recognize each other, but it's a structure that they call it a single singularity because it does not know where to go because there's no direction, it's one to the other. Uh, they don't have an identity of themselves, uh, they, we may call that. Both are anti-codons, but at the same time they are codons for each other. <laughs> then uh, that's the concept of a, a singularity. They, they, there's no direction, the transferase reaction that happens here may be back and forth. You change it, you, have, you make one reaction make a dimer of, of amino acids, then one goes out and another one comes in, it brings a new amino acid, then you make a tripeptide, then one comes out, another one comes in, then you get another amino acid, makes a tetrapeptide, and, uh, but you never know what, what was the code. Both were codes at the same time, and anti-codes. That's the idea. The code is something like this. Nowadays you have DNAs, the code reads like triplets in copies of one of the strands of the DNA, which is an RNA, and that's an amino acid, which is the product. That's the meaning of the, of the codes. Then the codes are here, and the meanings are here. These amino acids are the things that are stuck on the tails of tRNAs. And that's a small protein coming up. Here we have double helix, here we have some more complicated structures. Yeah. Now it's linear, which gets a 3D structure afterwards. The linearity comes from messenger RNA, which is this here. But this is the, the complicated thing. This is enough for saying how of where the protein synthesis machine originated from this singularity to get to the ribosome as a linear directional stuff. When we got to the, this is only to show you how I developed the concept of a living being starting from the genetic code studies that we made. When we were studying, we have, do you remember the previous slide, we have pairs of the tRNAs. The pairs of tRNAs mean pairs of anticodons where they bind one to the other. And then I started examining the whole genetic code table which is 16 square boxes. Each box has four triplets. Then you have 64 possible codons. And from these I was looking for the pairs. And how would the pairs give me an idea of what the structure of the genetic code is? It came out, uh, everybody that studies the genetic code wants to know one very simple thing, which is the order in which the amino acids got into the code, the order in which they were encoded. And uh, when you know this order, then you might be able to imagine or deduct what were the properties of the first peptides, because the first amino acids were of that kind, uh, which was the late structures, what was the, the first things to come. Uh, that's, that, that's the ideal of everybody who studies the code. Uh, the proposition I reached was that the first code was this pair, which is glycine here and glycine here. The anticodes are GG and CC. Uh, the second one was serine, which you have serine in both boxes, which is GA and CU. Nowadays, this glycine is substituted by proline. 
Uh, but the idea is that in the beginning it was glycine in both boxes here. Nowadays, sarin is still there. This is the only fossil evidence that we have for the code having started with pairs. Uh, there is a pair of sarin, which is the, the only fossil uh, of the early structure that uh, I imagine happened throughout the whole code. And when, we, when I had this uh, indication that the first were glycine and sarin, I had to look for the reason for that. The, the problem arose there because uh, this couple of amino acids that I proposed to be the first uh, was not accepted as the first ones in other models of the code. The main model comes from Sid, uh, Stanley Miller's and Eigen, Manfred Eigen. I think Lascano uh, likes this model too. He studied with uh, uh, Stanley Miller. Yeah. It's the model that proposes that uh, the amino acids first were in this row here, which is valine, alanine, glycine, and aspartic. That's the first, that every, most of the people use this as the first ones. But mine departed from it, it's glycine and sarin. And then I got stuck with it, oh, nobody will believe my model because I'm, I'm not agreeing with the most accepted uh, theory about it. And I had to look for uh, an excuse. At that time, I decided to retire, that was 2008, 10 years ago, and uh, I thought a model was good, but I had to study. Uh, you, you knew from the presentation of Marco that I was starting as a medical doctor. Medical doctors study only animals and the few microbes that make diseases. And these are all present-day organisms that use a code which, just, which are for heterotrophic organisms. We eat organic materials that are made by other organisms. And in these, we are digesters of pre-made organic matter, mostly glyc uh, glycose. Yeah? And all the models also use this heterotrophic thing. And in my knowledge of biochemistry, there was nothing that indicated this glycine and serine first. Then I had to retire to study it and I spent one year with a, a book of biochemistry of microorganisms, which is Brock, Brock, uh, to study that thing. And in there I found the reason for, for this proposal, glycine and serine being first, which is this pathway here. It's called the serine cycle or glycine serine cycle, which is the smallest of all cycles of central metabolism that people know of. It's called the glycine serine cycle. It goes from glycine to serin, which is, glycine has two carbons, serin has three carbons. There's many other compounds here, which are all three carbons. That's the pyruvate, pyruvic acid family. Then it gets another carbon here to make oxaloacetate, which is four carbons. And these compounds with four carbons divide into two compounds of two carbons each. One gives origin to glycine again, and the other is acetyl-CoA. Then this is very, very the simplest of all the central pathways of metabolism, which go from C2 to C4, and the C4 regenerates the C2. And uh, being so simple, uh, it starts with uh, two carbons. When you start with two carbons, the only sources of substrates that can give it is either another C2 or C1 plus C1. Then it's the simplest of all possible kinds of substrates. Substrates here are, are in this family of C1 sources. That CO2, formic acid, formaldehyde, methanol, or me methane. These, uh, and it's strange, it's both CO2 and CH4 are the greenhouse effect gases. 
Then these are the sources of uh, substrates for this. When you, uh, when you are using C1 compounds as substrates, you are already at the bottom of the well. You cannot go deeper looking for simpler substrates. Then it's, I think it's a good candidate to be in the first. The other argument on this is that uh, they are also the most abundant of organic sources on Earth or anywhere else. There is Enceladus, I think, which is a, a satellite of Jupiter, which has oceans of methane. Then this thing is abundant everywhere. Uh, and the atmospheres of what we know are all with abundant C1 compounds, and if you get C2, they are less abundant. If you get C3, they are even less than, than C2. The larger the molecule is, the less abundant it is. Then this is abundant substrate and simplest of all, making together the simplest of all pathways. Then I think this is a good indication that uh, the starting of metabolic pathways in organisms uh, follow the general rules of evolution of the universe. They follow the law of mass action going from abundant to less abundant, and they follow the gradients of energy, the gradients of mass, and I, and I think this is a one demonstration that the uh, origin of the metabolic pathway, which is also the origin of life, involved uh, laws of nature, which is not which is then nothing special or divine or, uh, or specific to life. It took what was more abundant.